Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Helming Your Way Through Strange Waters, my little introduction to the Kubernetes world. Once again, you're stuck with me as your navigator, Christopher Lillian Stolpe. Folks, this is part of a series, and we're, you're sort of, if this is your first one, you're sort of hopping in, not in the middle, but you've, you've missed a couple of episodes, and, and they do try and build on one another. So I would suggest and encourage you to go back and, and, and start from the beginning. Uh, but either way, uh, welcome for the ride. We've talked a little bit of, so far about why containers are important. What, why is cloud native important to the enterprise? What's going on in the enterprise from a software environment that actually makes um, this important as, a, uh, as an infrastructure and as a design pattern going forward in, in enterprises? And we've talked a little bit about some of the frictions that it causes and, and started to introduce some concepts around why containers are important. So. With that in mind, let's talk a little bit about what is a container. Isn't a container just a lightweight VM? And what's the heck is a pod? I hear Kubernetes manages pods. I thought Kubernetes managed containers. So we'll use a little bit of graphics to explain some of the differences here so that um, you understand that a VM and a container are actually very different things and solve different problems. This is the way we've sort of evolved in deploying applications. So initially, we deployed applications on a physical server. Since all these applications actually shared the operating system, that means they all competed with one another for the resources of that operating system. It also meant that if one application needed a certain thing loaded on that operating system, and another application needs another variant of the same thing loaded on that operating system, you could actually get collisions. That was dependency hell, and we talked about that before. So there are a couple of problems with this. Applications loaded on a server, these servers ended up running very low utilization, 5 10%. And we had all the issues with resource contention and dependency health, all these applications sharing a common operating system. So what was actually done was we moved from that world into this world. So we moved, and that move is the V it moved to virtual machines. Now, what this attempted to solve was the utilization factor. I now have the same server, but now I have multiple virtual servers running on top of it. So now I have a bunch of virtual servers that were smaller, so maybe now instead of 5%, they might be 10 or 15% utilized because they're smaller, and I've got more of them. So I mean, this drives my, my uses of the server up to 70% or so. So I get more use out of the server. That's great. The problem is that I still have a server here. This server is replicated here. So, all of the problems I had before, I brought with me, sort of the sins of the father. I still have resource contention. And I still have this problem here where all these apps are sharing the same binaries and libraries and actually operating system of the virtual machine. So all the resource contention problems, I still have dependency health still have all of those problems. All the things that made life hard for devs just moved over and I created more of them, but I, it's still the same thing. The other thing you'll notice is I'm now running not just one operating system, I'm running multiple operating systems on this host. And while some operating systems are more efficient than others, in reality, they're still fairly heavy things. So, I now have, if I've got 10 VMs, I'm running 11 copies of an operating system. So, let's draw that out. Originally, every application sort of needed its own version of an of a operating system, so these might have been different. But over time, enterprises have standardized. In the Linux world, they've standardized on Ubuntu or Red Hat or something else as their operating system. And they've, or in Windows, they sort of standardized on a, a standard Windows server operating system. So in reality, I'm running multiple copies of exactly the same operating system. 
So that's an, an inefficient use of resources. And while the server may be running around 70% utilization, a good chunk of that's actually taken up by running multiple copies of the same thing, the same resources, the same capabilities. And so some of that 70% gain is actually taken by the duplication operating systems and, and underlying shared resources. And I still have all the problems with deploying applications in shared servers. So let's take a look at the alternative. And the alternative is container environments. So in container environment, this looks like a VM, but it's not. If you'll notice, this container here doesn't have an operating system. It doesn't have that. The only operating system is down here. So all of these containers share the same operating system resources. And you say, well, that aren't me in dependency hell and have resource constraints, etc." Yes and no. What's actually happening is the container, as we talked about a little bit earlier, packages all the dependencies that application needs to run. And the container orchestration system, drawing this a little bit better now, actually makes sure, and this, this orchestration system, by the way, is actually very lightweight. It's almost more of an, appli an application than, uh, than uh, a big part of the platform. This container runtime makes sure that the operating system here is configured to only show this container a private view of the operating system and its own resources that we've packaged with it. This container can see nothing about this container. This container here can't see those binaries and libraries. It can't conflict with them. This application has its own binaries and libraries. This container here can't see the underlying operating system capabilities that have been exposed to this container. In fact, as far as this container is concerned, it is the only thing running on this host because it sees a segmented view of the operating system that gives it its own networking stack, its own storage stack, its own memory. It doesn't even know that these other containers exist. As far as it is concerned, it is really the only thing running on that server. It can't even talk to those if it wants to unless the orchestration system allows it to. So we've avoided the dependency hell because it has its own view of the operating system. It is resource constrained within that, within that dedicated part of the operating system for that. It can't talk to anything else. It can't get into anyone else's space. It can only use the resources that have been specifically assigned to it within its fragment. And that's done using tools in the Linux kernel called namespaces and C groups. Windows has similar constructs. We won't go into exactly what those things are, but this thing, as far as it's concerned, is the only thing running on the server. We get very high utilization. We have no collisions. So that's what a container is. So what's a pod? A pod is simply a container of containers. Let's say I decide Folks who developed Kubernetes knew that many times you might want to have multiple containers part of the same service and they need to deploy together. So why not do give the ability to have those C groups and those namespaces scoped to enclose more than one container? So that's what uh, Kubernetes does is that Kubernetes can deploy a pod, which is really a container that is made up of multiple containers internally. So these containers still are containers inside. They still have their dependencies and their dependencies aren't going to overlap, but they're going to share some amount of kernel resources 
with each other so they can communicate, say, via kernel messaging uh, or other higher performance capabilities or share files, et cetera, among them. So it's actually a way of clustering containers into a larger super container. Most pods in Kubernetes are made of exactly one container today. But there are plenty, there are lots of cases where people deploy multiple containers into a pod. Or, and there's also some of the tooling around Kubernetes. You might hear about things called sidecars. We'll talk about those later, where a sidecar is actually one of the containers in a pod and it's injected by Kubernetes to do things within that container. So now we understand a little bit about VMs and containers, how they are actually very different beasts. They solve different problems. So they may look like the same thing, but they really aren't. And it's the capabilities and the design of this model here that solves the problem for the dev teams and solves the efficiency problem for the infrastructure teams as well. So this is inherently a new model. That's why this is important. This is the model that seems to be sticking right now. Thank you very much for paying attention. Hope this explained a little bit about differences between VMs and containers. And we'll talk more about how Kubernetes manages um, sees of hundreds of thousands of these things across thousands of servers. And we'll talk about that starting in the next episode. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, please reach out to me on the email on the, on the, the slide that you see now. And have a good night, day, rest of your weekend, whatever it is. And hope to again, see you again soon. Thank you again.